とやまたつはたぽつきてもわんなまわいえとはまくえとはかやたくわかいてがるファレファレいてたいファレファレひはのれらちへいまいるわらあくてめひつわたいきてまなふにわてないわひてないろひけがいうかとはたうらがもわなてないてめひやつきはこうとあかいてしわきあうあいったほとたたたうねいうやてわかとうひやあのれらあめひまいきゃまたうあのれらあてなこうとうてなたたかとはあアンデニパルルアイアマンフォーレットウェイショーランタイムソウアウトランナーゲットルーダスケミアヤラファガオバタンアンアウプレゼンテーションウィテンアウトタイムフレムアンボーンブリードンオポツキウィチズオニティウェイウズドライフォンヒアオンエイストエイストコーストマイトライブエスファガトウヒアマイプライマリーハプウアンアーティパチュモアナエンアーティルワアヘッドプレヴィッジョブグローンアップエットホームエンアストリフヒアアヘッドフォーチョー Uh, my wife is Pakeha, fourth generation, uh, who has resided in Oporski. We have no desire to leave、uh, Oporski. It's a beautiful place, despite what you might have seen on TV.、Uh, it's just media trying to hype up,、uh, trying to get stories out of a little place like、uh, our town there in Oporski. We have a beautiful story.、Um, I hope you enjoy it.、Um, but, uh, and thanks for the introduction. I think you've covered off a, a few points that I wanted to make. So,、um, in my Uh, work capacity. I'm the iwi development manager for the Whakatohe Māori Trust Board.、Um, this is my 20th year working for my iwi. When you work for your iwi,、uh, you work from your time that you're allocated plus all the other hours that you, you have responsibilities that you have, have to provide back to your, your people.、Um, so, for those of you who don't know who we are, just a little bit of a, a story about where I come from. So, the blue lines are the traditional boundaries of my tribe, Whakatohe. And、uh, the little dots in the middle there are, are our marae there. Our name、uh, is derived from our ancestor Muriwai, who came from the Matatsu or Waka.、Uh, Whakato here、um, is derived from the word tohe tohe, which means、uh, to be stubborn. And so Muriwai,、uh, and maybe if,、uh, if I win him,、um, might not like this story, but、uh, she was our opponent in the ancestors. So we had a female、uh, chieftainess that we descend from. The name Tohe Tohe is in relation to the, the drowning of her two sons、uh, out at sea out here.、Uh, when she heard that they drowned,、uh, they called for her to come out of her cave at Whakatane and she wouldn't come. So we're now known as the, the stubborn people or the stubborn tribe, the Tohe Tohe people.、Uh, Whakatohe is where we get our name from. And so we, we have our six main hapu、uh, that、uh, reside there、uh, in this beautiful part of the, the country. Uh, from prosperity to no patsu. So, part of our journey, journey was looking back to our past and understanding that actually our people were, were prosperous. At one point in time, we had 22 trading vessels、uh, based in the Portuguese, which represented a quarter of all registered boats at the time were situated there in all of Aotearoa.、Okay? So, we were doing really well、uh, trading with、uh, other iwi along the coastline, also with the Pakeha that settlers that were coming, living here. Uh, and trading as far as Australia as well. So we built up a wealth, our people built up a wealth right up until the mid 1860s. Unfortunately, during the land wars,、uh, the, particularly with the government's、uh, push to, to take land for settlement purposes,、um, we lost our land through Raupatu, through land confiscations. And so that was a devastation to us.、Uh, it was a heavy impact on our people.、Um, Uh, due to the loss of a,、um, Karl v o l k n e r who was killed in Oporski、uh, on the 2nd of March 1865, that then led to the, the invasion of Crown forces, who used that as their excuse to confiscate Whakatohe Whenua.、Um, however, the confiscation wasn't just、um, based around our Whakatohe land, it also extended from Makitu, where some f a n a went yesterday, across Ngati Awa land, Ngati Rangiti, Tuhoi, and Whakatohe. So all of our, our Whenua was confiscated because. Uh, of the death of、um, the missionary Karl v o l k n e r And、uh, our people were placed into a reservation,、uh, and the model that was used was the same as that that was used in, in America、uh, with the First Nations groups, where our people were forcefully removed from their whenua, from their land, and placed into a small block、uh, of unproductive land、uh, for them to survive. And so I grew up there on that、uh, reservation block known as o p a p e The o p a p e Native Reserve, although I didn't know that that was a reservation. And so to this day,、uh, we still see the impacts of the,、um, the Raupatu on our people、uh, in the socio economic 
disparities that we suffer or see within our community. Uh, our people are still struggling, although we only have about 10% of our whakatohe population living at home. The 90% that have left and gone off to get educated uh, and to find work have done really well for themselves. So there's some irony in that, is that our people generally are doing well, but they've had to leave home uh, to, to prosper. From trauma to transformation is, I guess, the next stage that I've been heavily involved with is, is to try and find ways for our iwi, uh, working with our, our whānau and our hapu, uh, to move forward from those traumatic periods. And part of that too uh, was the formation of the Whakatohe Māori Trust Board, a legal entity that brought all of our hapu together to start working on ideas as to how we can rebuild that prosperity that was once lost. Uh, in 2010, we conducted this amazing wellbeing survey, where it was the first time we'd sat down with um, a huge portion of our iwi and asked them questions about their aspirations for the future. So nobody had done that before. Uh, so that helped us to develop the 50-year strategic plan for our iwi. And then last year, we finally got to sign the deed of settlement, uh, which acknowledges, I guess, the Crown's breaches against the treaty uh, and the heavy impact that it um, had caused on us as, as a tribe. So we're currently going through our transition process now into that post-settlement space. Um, our vision uh, is based around kai, uh, which is um, not a surprise for Māori, is that uh, where we settled are places where we had an abundance of food. The, the vision that we have is, is, a, is a whakatauki, a proverb that goes back many generations, ko te kai huki e waiawa. And so it reminds us about the sustainability of our tribe um, in places that we have around our community, the same as other iwi along the, the coastline here. Um, and Waiawa is one s specific place within our uh, tribal area uh, that provided a lot of sustainable foods uh, within the rivers and the bush and the sea, and our people prospered there uh, long before the arrival of uh, the Pākehā into Aotearoa. And I guess um, part of that translation for us in that vision is to be the food bowl that feeds the world. Uh, not only literally providing food, um, but in terms of our culture and our heritage uh, and sharing who we are with the rest of the world. So that's our, our vision. Uh, in terms of one of the key goals that we had was Kia Pumo Kito Tato Whakatohia Tanga to, to hold on to everything that is Whakatohia. Um, and uh, we have this term Whakatohia Tanga. What does it mean to be Whakatohia? And so these are really important questions that we have to ask ourselves uh, in terms of the way that we, um, our culture is, the way that we, uh, uh, our belief systems, our behaviours, and all those sorts of things. And so uh, because we were also um, deemed to be a landless tribe, we couldn't look to the land for, for that prosperity to redevelop ourselves because it was taken uh, through land confiscations. And so um, back in 1990. Uh, three, uh, we had a group of our elders that came together. Uh, one of our kaumātua um, put the idea on the table amongst our elders that perhaps we need to look to the sea to regain that prosperity. And because nobody else uh, was doing anything other than going fishing, diving, that sort of thing, but perhaps that was the opportunity for Whakatohe to, to regain its prosperity. The other question that we needed to ask though was, um, what is that cultural knowledge that we have around these spaces, our mātauranga? Um, but also, what are our customs? What, is, what are the tikanga that we have that are associated with that mātauranga? So for us, mātauranga is one portion, but we also need to ensure that we carry out uh, equally the tikanga, the customs that are associated with all of those traditions. And how can we ensure that our, our knowledge systems are acknowledged and can help with customary and economic decision making and now to hear Moana. So that's really important that we we are also uh, equal decision makers, if not leading the way in decision making um, for economic prosperity. So just a little bit of a journey about uh, the mussel farm uh, in particular. Um, way back in 1996, we had the opportunity to start looking at the different pathways in terms of utilising water space. Uh, out here in Te Moana Atoi, um, in, in front of Wapotiki there, uh, for the allocation of a mussel farm. Uh, the Whakatoa here eventually uh, gained um, the right to utilise water space, uh, 3,800 hectares, 
To give you an idea of how big that is, that's uh, about nine and a half kilometres in length and 4.5 kilometres in width. So uh, it's a huge amount of area, uh, water space. Um, and then inside there we also have another 1,000 hectares uh, for a different purpose. Um, so nearly 5,000 hectares of water space is what we currently have the uh, right to use. And so we had to go through these processes and it was interesting that from a legal perspective, you know what you've uh, enc um, encountered there. Uh, we spent many years going through legal challenges as well um, to get the consent to have our water space uh, utilised for uh, the mussel farm. So way back in 2012, uh, we started to put mussel lines into the water to trial open ocean mussel farming. It was the first time anybody had done this in Aotearoa. Um, and there were many challenges, of course, here in the Bay of Plenty uh, with the, the weather, the currents, and particularly when storms come. So the structures and the designs of the mussel farm um, had to be adapted to suit the environment that we had out here. So luckily for us, we had uh, our partners, in particular Cawthron, but also the University of Waikato, uh, working alongside us in, in all of that research space. Uh, fast forward to um, 2020, uh, and thankfully, um, I, I do thank Jane Jones, I guess, and the Provincial Growth Fund uh, that was there at the time, because it helped to accelerate the dreams and aspirations of us, of our, uh, our tribe. Um, the funding was allocated to support the build of a muscle factory in Oportiki and then uh, the funding was also provided to build a, a harbour entrance um, in Oportiki as well to allow for the commercial boats to come back into the Oportiki harbour just as our ancestors used to do um, way before um, the lands were confiscated in Oportiki. So we were very lucky and fortunate to have those funds invested into our community. As a result, uh, the muscle company that we've set up called Whakatohia Muscles or Portiki Limited is owned by multiple shareholders. And in particular, um, we have marae trusts, we have whānau trusts, we have individuals, uh, we have locals, we have Māori and Pākehā, um, we have local iwi that are now our neighbouring iwi that are now invested in the development of the Whakatohia Muscles company uh, for the Open Ocean um, project. And it's because of all that investment that we've had that we've been able to develop. Um, so uh, that's part of that journey that we've been on as well. This has all been part of a... Oh, Sorry, okay. um, in 2020 you had another abbreviation there. I picked up what WMOL is. Oh. Oh, the Whakatohia Māori Trust Board. Oh, sorry. Yes. So uh, I guess we're the main mandated iwi organisation that has, has led the development. Uh, it's because of the aspirations of the tribe um, that we, we are in this space. So we've, we've had to rely on many stakeholders, uh, the government included, institutions to help get everything to this point that we're, we're currently in. And as I was going to say, the, um, this is because we've, we've had a really clear strategy that we uh, developed alongside uh, the Cawthron Institute as well as the University of Waikato. Um, but the key part for where I'm at right now um, in terms of the development is, is building our capacity. So we realised, okay, we've got systems and things in place, um, structures, but now we actually need to turn back to focus on the development of our community in light of what the agriculture industry is going to provide for all of us. So it starts off right at preschool, early childhood education, kōhanga reo. And we, we had these wānanga about, OK, what, what, can, what can we do with agriculture now in that early childhood space? And it comes back to the stories of um, tangaroa, hinemoa, hinemoana, uh, the creation stories. You know, if we start feeding in the, the connection of those, those stories, that have been taught to us from when we were children uh, into uh, early childhood, they get their first taste of their connection to the moana, to the ocean. So the next stage in primary schools is, uh, is a part of our curriculum development is allowing them to engage in those spaces that they've learnt about uh, along the beach, to go to the, the muscle rocks, to go to the pippi beds, all of these spaces. 
When you get to the secondary school, which is what we're doing now with Cawthron, is developing aquaculture programs, more science-based, so they're getting more hands-on, they're uh, dissecting mussels, they're doing all these things. So we're setting up a, a science lab specific, specifically for aquaculture. And then the next stage is, um, I guess, whatever the, the tastes are of our people, whether it might be engineering or um, actually going into science or further education, other fields that are wrapped around the industry, then uh, we're setting up um, with institutions different pathways for them post-college. So this is, this is the plan that we have, and I think it's about being able, if we want to build an industry, we have to build up our community and our people. And this is driven uh, not only by Whakatō here, but also by um, local council who are heavily invested in a lot of the, the other things. Our, all of our schools, uh, they're all participating in their different ways, um, and they all uh, acknowledge and have bought into the bigger picture and the bigger vision around aquaculture in Oporski. So um, that's, a, that's a key part. And they're working with our other partners, our institutions, is looking at what other species there, there are. So green shell mussel, uh, obviously the, the key um, product for us. And we want to make sure that um, commercially it goes really well. We want to make sure that the, uh, the factory can generate a profit for the shareholders. Uh, we haven't quite got there yet, but it's on the way to generating a profit. Um, and employment-wise, uh, the company um, from 2020, when we had, I think, 10 employees, we now have 220, um, and that's only at 40% uh, capacity at the moment in the farm. So the farm is continuing to, to develop, develop in size, which means that we'll get more and more employment coming. Uh, in our sediment package, we also are receiving another 5,000 hectares of water space on top of what we already have. So essentially, you would um, well potentially double the economic benefit um, on the in the water space uh, from our initial intentions. So educating and training our people being the number one priority for us, um, and then the integration of our Matauranga and Tikanga Māori, um, our practices, our, our knowledge systems, and everything that we do is just as important as um, the work itself and, and growing and selling mussels. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the uh, Simon Mancaster from the University of Waikato. So our connection with the Sustainable Seas Project has been with uh, Simon uh, around uh, exploring uh, the sustainable options around Pātiki or flounder. Um, and so we've also been working with uh, the whānau from Matakana Island. Uh, we're really, really keen to, to take it to the next level in terms of providing opportunities around um, uh, potential for commercial uh, outcomes for Pātiki, but with the main priority for sustainability regenerating the flounder stocks, stocks within our waterways. Um, so that's been a really awesome project. Um, also as a part of this, we also need to understand that we build the right infrastructure to support these aspirations. Thankfully, with the government investment, also the Regional Council, um, they've uh, helped us to get that journey underway. Uh, Commercialising is really important, but not at the cost of the environment. So we're really clear on that as, as iwi, as our community, uh, that we work side by side with all of our environmental um, uh, champions to make sure that we don't diminish the mana, the modi that we have within our water space. Uh, and then finally, um, we're just in the process of, of developing our own research, uh, a centre for of excellence for research, uh, development and training. So uh, traditionally, researchers would come to us and say, would you like to participate in this research project? Um, we're starting to flip that around now and we're putting the research questions on their table say, to say would you be able to conduct this research for us. So it's just changing the dynamic so that uh, iwi and communities have um, more direct uh, say in what that research looks like going forward. Um, this is, oh, that's not the real photo but it is standing, it is built, was built in um, 2021 through COVID as well. Um, and the factory is, has been built uh, oversized to cope, cope with the future uh, development. The mussels that are currently going through the factory, uh, majority, 80% of them are going to the US market um, and uh, some are going to the UK and Australia. 
Uh, and I think there's uh, maybe two 40-foot containers that are leaving there a week. Um, this is just a quick idea of what the structures look like and the work that Cawthron uh, had done. So generally, you know, when you go to see a mussel farm, you see the, the main mussel line at the top of the water. But because it's in the open ocean, they had to drop it down five metres below the top of the surface because if you can imagine where the waves are, that's where all the pressure is. So if you take the pressure away by dropping them down, one of the cool inventions was this uh, submersible buoy. I don't know if anyone here was, had worked on it. That actually sits with at the five metre mark. So it doesn't come up too high, it doesn't go a bit down too low, but it allows it to, to sit around that five metre mark. Um, and yeah, the lines, these lines are 200 metres long, uh, but when you stretch the muscle lines out themselves, they're about four kilometres in line. Uh, and as I mentioned before, um, the investment into the whole project has been by multiple owners. Actually, the last capital raise, uh, we allowed, uh, the company allowed for um, um, collect, uh, what do you call it, uh, collectives of uh, people um, with a minimum of $10,000 investment. Um, but you were able to invest as, as a whanau. So you know, maybe the whanau were able to raise $1,000 each. So you, if you've got 10 people that had $1,000 each, that's your, collect, your collective, and then you go, go ahead and buy your, your shares. And so that's how we got a lot of our own whānau to invest for the first time in shares in a company. Um, and it worked really well. Others were able to obviously put more money into it, but we had limits to the amount of money that in, any individual um, could put or invest into the company as well, because we didn't want uh, people to monopolise um, the decision making. Uh, and um, this was the other project that PGF funded uh, here in Portugal. This was the first harbour entrance um, project in the country in uh, over 100 years. Um, this is about $100 million. So what this will allow for us uh, now is an open uh, port uh, that will allow uh, boats to come in and out um, in most weather conditions. Um, and it's, we won't be limited uh, due to, um, uh, you know, uh, high speed. Uh, sandbar uh, or low river conditions, that sort of thing. The next part would be the development of our marina uh, space uh, in Oporsuke, which will allow for the mussel barges that we currently have in Whakatane uh, to, to moor here. Um, and yeah, there's just some cool photos here. As a part of um, the, the settlement process too, I think with the kaupapa being mana motuhake, uh, allowing us to um, apply some uh, specific things that are related to here around mana, mana whenua, so us as the, the people of the land, um, to have more specific um, redress around the land itself and the ocean uh, was really important to us. Um, but these are, the, these are the key components to our settlement. It's all about the land, uh, the ocean and the people. Um, yep, we, we do talk about the money, the, the settlement money that's coming that will help invest in to the aspirations. However, it's more about uh, us um, regaining things that we had lost and giving back to, to our people. And specifically for this particular kaupapa, um, uh, yes, the, the other initiatives that we've initiated in our settlement um, around the, the moana, the sea as well. Uh, just to give you an, a little idea of what, what that looks like in financial terms. Um, uh, it was $100 million, the, the settlement that we'll receive, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, however, we've never relied on the settlements to develop. Uh, we've always thought that if our people were able to do uh, and be prosperous uh, on the land with the resources they had around them, why can't we do the same? So a settlement to us uh, hopefully will help to, um, as I said, accelerate the dreams and aspirations that we we already have in place. Kapoi. So that's my kōrero whānau. Um, I hope you enjoyed what I had to share. Uh, kia ora papa. One of the many inspiring um, stories just to love, particularly at the moment, with our very interesting political environment, when we find examples of iwi, hapu, whānau flourishing, not just surviving, but thriving, um, and under their own steam, um, despite all of the impediments that might be put in front of mm. them. So, um, one question, Tony, one question.
speak for other states. Um, yes, uh, a great, great talk. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's uh, something that was on my radar for quite a while. It's very interesting, and I'm really interested to read more. But one question is a little bit. Um, what, what about the? You haven't talked too much about the consenting issue, and that we hear a lot about. You know, this, this new expansion of 25 years in consenting for for your type of operation. Is that you know the expansion from the end of next year into 25 more years of yep. uh, of uh, activities? Is that really consenting? Is that, is that affecting you? What, what, what's your thought on the pro on, on that on that project? I mean, I'm not having any preconceived idea. I'm just really interested yeah. in the, this type of. Um, I think the reconsenting is not going to be so challenging, but um, I think the challenge has always been around a new consent, um, particularly with other fisheries. 3,800 hectares is a large amount of water space, and um, uh, yeah, many, many of the, f the fishing um, companies uh, challenged uh, us on the fact that that was probably their main fishing ground, but I'm sure they would say that anywhere. But, um, and um, that was that was the main challenge. Um, I think we generally thinking we had a lot of support from the iwi, the other iwi. Uh, with the new water space that's coming under settlement, um, there has been a lot of toing and froing with the neighbouring iwi, Ngāti Awa especially, uh, because um, essentially, you, you know, how do we define a, a boundary within the ocean for um, for an iwi, as if you were, you know, the mana moana, I guess, or the uh, arohe moana, so your, your traditional boundaries within the, the water space. So there had been, a, I think, a, a bit of negotiating happening within that space within Ngāti Awa. Um, when the consenting process comes up for that, maybe that, that will continue, I'm not too sure. <coughs> However, the Te Whanua and Ngāi Tai are also uh, looking probably to apply for, a con for water space in their areas. Um, and um, they'll probably have to go through the same same chal legal challenges, I guess, from uh, probably uh, fishing the f fishing industry, I think, in, in particular. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you again. Sure.